This is CBC Here and Now. Just disappointment that we can't go. So any of those trips that involve uh, Northern Italy are being looked at. Two school trips to Europe canceled because of the coronavirus. It was my vision to race with another female. It's run primarily on volunteers, which is the Labrador way. And in the big land, it's off to the races. One of the most difficult races in the world is set to start this weekend. Good evening. Two school trips to Europe have been canceled because of concerns over the coronavirus. One of the destinations is on Canada's list of countries not to visit unless it's necessary. Here now's Cease Hair reports. Disappointment that we can't go, but you know, there's not a lot we can do, so it's just disappointment mostly. Molly McEachran in grade eight at Beaconsfield Junior High is one of 40 students at five schools not packing bags for her Easter break trip to France, Spain and Italy. Mostly she was looking forward to Italy, not just for the art and culture, but the cuisine. I was looking forward to the food a lot because I really like Italian food and I was really excited to have like Italian food in Italy because it's like a whole other level of Italian food. So that, that would have been pretty exciting. They were headed to northern Italy, specifically right where Canada advises people to avoid non-essential travel. Outside of Asia, Italy has one of the highest number of confirmed coronavirus cases. The Eastern School District says since the global impact of the virus is changing constantly, it's keeping a close eye on other student excursions that are booked this year. 25 to 30 schools. Uh, roughly with uh, six, seven hundred students involved traveling in the, the, the upcoming months. So it's a, quite a volume of students. So there's still a lot of work to do and a lot of monitoring to occur between now and the date that those trips are planned for. The virus is affecting travel plans worldwide. Nick Fraser, a jazz drummer from Toronto in St. John's for a few shows, says he's supposed to go to Northern Italy the end of this month for a tour with some musicians there. It hasn't been canceled, he says, but at this point, who knows? I'll just have to make a decision and, and uh, figure out if I can get my travel rebooked or my money back on a plane ticket and stuff. I, you know, I'm just kind of sitting here with my fingers crossed hoping that it goes away, but it doesn't seem like that's happening. <laughs> As for the two cancelled trips in this province, the board's Tony Stack says some of the feedback he's getting is a sense of relief over not having to endure any risks associated with the virus. Cease here, CBC News, St. John's. A local cruise ship expert says the industry isn't being proactive when it comes to stopping the spread of COVID-19. Ross Klein says ships are especially susceptible to the spread of the viruses. And while there is a lot that can be done, he says the industry doesn't seem to have learned from its past experiences. I think they're learning as they go. And what I find unfortunate is that this is an industry that's adept at dealing with virus. They have, they've been dealing with norovirus now for 20 years plus and have become quite effective in terms of how, how to contain the virus and how to sanitize uh, surfaces so that passengers don't uh, pass it on to others. In this case, it's, a, it's another virus. It would seem to respond to the same kinds of interventions, but they don't seem to be following those same protocols. I think that uh, it's a wonderful opportunity for our athletes, a wonderful opportunity for the city to be exposed to 20,000 people and that we'd be idiots not to take it. So who is Dr. Pat Parfrey calling idiots and why? We'll have that answer shortly. lovely day out there today across most of the province. We did see some onshore flurries again along the west coast as expected. Uh, same thing up through Labrador. But as that area of low pressure moves out, we're looking at the next one. It's getting to its act together now just off the coast of the United States. That's going to head our way as we head towards Sunday, uh, rather Saturday into Sunday. We already have a snowfall warning in place for most of eastern Newfoundland. Special weather statement uh, for a couple of other areas as well. We're we're looking at uh, some pretty significant snowfall for most of us. Just want to show you quickly. We'll time out exactly when this is going to fall and uh, what the winds are going to be like when I come back.
All right, warming up the snowblower and the Liberal leadership race, that's heating up as well. Candidate Andrew Fury was out shaking hands in Conception Bay North today, trying to drum up votes for a leadership contest this spring, but also addressing some controversy. Here now's Terry Roberts has that story. Andrew Fury has campaigned for Pam Parsons in a past election. Today, Parsons was returning the favour as Fury looks to become the province's 14th Premier. It is a bit of a reversal. Um, I am supporting Andrew. Uh, he's, been a, he's been a friend of mine. I'm, I, first and foremost, he's a good person. But this tweet of support from NALCOR board chairman Brendan Paddock has ignited controversy with John Abbott, Fury's lone opponent, accusing Paddock of political interference and calling for Paddock's resignation. It is totally inappropriate. It violates any rules around political activity and he cannot be both chair of NALCOR and the chairleader for Andrew Fury. PC leader Chess Crosby describes Paddock's tweet as totally inappropriate. For him to be intermeddling in, in liberal politics right now is undermining the confidence the public can have in him that he is focused on entirely on the interests of the corporation. Paddock says he was just sending best wishes to a friend. I don't believe he's uh, done anything wrong. And Fury says Paddock was not representing Nalcor when he wrote the tweet. He did that as a friend. Uh, I didn't ask him to do it. He did it in supporting any friend. And I think he subsequently said he would do that for other friends if they came forward. Meanwhile, the race is now set. A two-man contest. Andrew Fury, the orthopedic surgeon, versus John Abbott, the long-serving senior bureaucrat. Fury clearly has the momentum. Most Liberal MHAs are behind him, and some key party organizers have also pledged their support. And based on his visit to this Bay Roberts coffee shop today, Fury is connecting with people, in some cases on a very personal level. He did a real good operation on my grandson. He broke his two wrists and Dr. Fury did a number one job on him, put him back in shape. But not all Liberal loyalists are in Fury's corner. I will be supporting uh, John Abbott, okay? I honestly think that he's the most uh, uh, qualified for the job. Liberals will have the final say on who will be their next leader and our next premier soon enough. The party revealed today that more than 2,000 people have so far registered to vote in the Liberal Leadership Convention on May 9th. Terry Roberts, CBC News, Bay Roberts. So where does the leadership race go from here? Well, as you can see here, now Peter Cowan is with me live. So Peter, what's your sense? Obviously things have just starting to get going, what are we facing? Well, interestingly, Anthony, either one of those two candidates, if they are elected, will make history because never before has someone become premier without ever being tested in an election. And let's start with Andrew Fury. He is clearly the front runner here. He has the backing of almost the entire cabinet, a good chunk of the caucus, and even some of the backroom people that helped Dwight Ball become leader seven years ago. But as we saw in Terry's piece, he's also had a few of his stumbles. There were, of course, in the invitations that went out for that campaign launch, some concerns about whether he had access to insider lists, something he denies. And then there's the tweet from his friend and chair of the board of NALCOR, Brendan Paddock, that uh, we heard about in the piece there. But what about the other corner? Well, that's where we've got John Abbott. It was clear from his launch speech this week he's hoping to win more on policy than on the connections. He's talking of reigning in spending while improving outcomes for health and social services, but he doesn't have a single MHA or MP behind him, and that's going to be a challenge. It's not just the name recognition, but it also means he doesn't have the politicians and their big network of resources across the province and volunteers that he'll be able to reach out to. Um, and, you know, like we saw there with Pam Parsons earlier, you've got an MHA who will take you out door knocking and get you some of that support, Anthony. All right. So the first part of this race, uh, obviously, you've got to try to sign up people and all that. But looking at both the launches this week, and you cover them both, it seems to me you've got Fury saying, I'm for transformational change, but he's got almost all the people who are there behind him. And you've got an outsider. So who's the real change candidate here? What's your sense of how that's going to play out? We need to see more of the policy because Andrew Fury so far hasn't really said anything aside from, hey, I'm here and I'm going to bring lots of hope and maybe do things differently. We don't know what are the specific policies. Abbott has started to roll out some broad things. Uh, certainly, Abbott is the guy who's coming from the outside of the party establishment. But the interesting thing is he has the government experience. He's been behind the scenes running a government, and that's the thing that Andrew Fury lacks. He hasn't been on the inside actually running things, but he has been involved in the politics. So. 
and she'll let people know uh, if politics is your thing. It's a very interesting race because, as Peter said, whoever wins, this is going to be premier of this province, and you're going to have something on the website this week. Yeah, I'll have more details looking at uh, the big advantage that Andrew Fury has at the start of this race. Uh, it's going to go up uh, tomorrow morning on cbc.ca slash announce. Okay, have a great weekend, and uh, check out Peter's analysis uh, tomorrow on our website, and uh, it's a good read. Take a look. All right, uh, think of the athletes. That's what a long time and much respected member of the province's sports community is saying to naysayers of the 2025 Canada Summer Games. Well, some say the province just isn't ready to host an event of that size. When asked this week if Newfoundland and Labrador is ready to host the games in four years time, retired sports psychology professor Baz Cavanaugh said no. Six years ago, Cavanaugh was part of a report that found the province's sports structures Knee, are in some kind of need of major financial investment to get ready for this kind of event. And he says nothing has changed. But Pat Parfrey disagrees, saying it's not as costly as many people think. We don't have to spend a lot of money. We can choose to spend a lot of money. We need a new track that would cost about five million bucks to build up behind CBC. Um, if you want to put stands in, it'll cost a bit more. We have great facilities at uh, the King George, the Swatter Trophy Club the uh, baseball, softball, the sports centre. Um, I think that we have facilities that will host the Canada Games. And if Prince George and PEI can host it, why can't we? Well, to a sad national sports story now, Henri Richard, one of the most glorious of the Montreal Canadiens legends and Hockey Hall of Famers, has died. Richard played for the Habs for 20 years, joining the team in 1955 when his bigger brother, Maurice Rocket Richard, was still playing. Henri, the pocket rocket, excelled at face-offs, stick handling, and was integral to 11, yeah, 11, not going to happen again, Stanley Cup winning teams, scoring two Cup winning goals. And when he retired in 1975, his jersey was raised to the rafters of the Montreal Forum. He was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease five years ago. Henri Richard was 84 years of age. Well, to the West Coast now, the works of Phyllis Cooper have been seen right around the world, and she's one of several artists who's taking part in Indigenous Week activities at the Grenfell campus in Cornerbrook this week. And as Troy Turner reports, Cooper's Indigenous culture shines right through her work. Beaded work carries with it meaning and history. Each moccasin is hand-stitched with intricate precision. Her leather creations convey a culture and its history. Phyllis Cooper started practicing her art about 30 years ago, a way to pass on her culture and its traditions. One time you didn't wear Aboriginal things either because you would stand out and you would be, uh, you know, tormented by people. But now, everywhere you go, uh, people are... are doing their thing, you know, they're making, they're making their own clothing, they're making uh, our, our regalia, and we're wearing it, you know, and, and we're celebrating. It. Cooper grew up in the Bay of Islands, but her family's roots are in Con River. When she married, she moved to Stephenville. Her connection to her Mi'kmaq heritage has never waned. My mother told us when we were children, although uh, when you went to uh, certain places, you weren't allowed to talk about being Aboriginal because it wasn't accepted. But I always told everybody, I guess I was the rebel. I, I didn't care what my thought was. Well, you, you know, if you don't like me because I'm Aboriginal, well, I guess that's your problem. It's not my problem as long as I don't do anything that I'm going to hurt somebody else. Cooper says the educational benefits help Mi'kmaq people find better work. She is touched and proud of the newfound respect for her way of life. It, uh, I get really emotional. It just makes me feel good. While Phyllis Cooper says she doesn't get to as many craft fairs as she used to, she is trying new things and every day brings a new challenge and a new idea that she could practice her art. Troy Turner, CBC News, Cornerbrook. Well, tomorrow morning, one of the most extreme racing competitions in the world begins. Racers will assemble on Kane's Quest start line for a grueling 3,000 kilometer race. Teams will ride through some of the country's harshest conditions to try to win the competition, along with the unique bragging rights that come with that victory. Here now is Meg Roberts explains from Labrador City. Last minute preparations are happening here now, but tomorrow morning the start line will be packed with fans and racers 
48 teams will fly out of here to embark on a 3100 kilometer race across rugged Labrador terrain. It's also a history making year as the first all female team has entered the competition and there's two of them. One of the women's teams coming from Finland and the other is made up of former Labradorian Kareen Paul and her partner Rebecca Charles. Paul is the first woman to ever race in Kane's Quest after competing with her husband in 2014. But this year she wanted to try something different was my vision to race with another female so I can again open those doors and and show the world that there's the ability to participate um, that if it's something that you're really interested in take the jump like just do it. Although it will be the first time racing in the competition for most of the women there are some seasoned vets coming back to compete. This will be Dave Dumaresque and his partner Shannon Strangemore's eighth Canes Quest race. They were planning on retiring two years ago, but Dumaresque was involved in a bad accident that had him airlifted off the course. He hit a snowdrift going about 110 kilometers an hour and broke his hip. Yeah, because we didn't finish, that was a big setback for us, and it was a hard pill for us to swallow. And uh, like I said earlier, if we would have finished the race, we probably would have been done. But we got to give it one more kick in the can. On top of getting injured, racers also could face frostbite, dehydration and even hallucinations. The grueling race lasts anywhere from five to six days, but riders say this might be the fastest year yet. Competition organizers have staggered the start line only one minute apart this year. Racers think it might make the competition even more competitive. Once again, fans can track the racers in real time online. The teams will push their minds, bodies and machines to the max so they can get back here to the finish line. Meg Roberts, CBC News, Labrador City. To always have that ongoing concern of not knowing whether I should be looking over my shoulder or not knowing whether I should be taking different routes every time I walk someplace in town. A support group for safety. These women are at risk of being killed by their ex-partners. How Prince Edward Island is creating a circle of safety.
Welcome back to the program. First, we start with breaking news. Temperatures are dropping into the minus single digits. Time now to check in with our Carolyn Stokes. It is just packed with people. The company says it's picking up salmon. Looks like an absolutely gorgeous afternoon. All right, so during the break, Ashley was reminding me to uh, get some gasoline for my good friend, the snowblower. <laughs> Apparently, we'll be getting reacquainted. Yes, you will be, and yeah. you'll get an extra hour to shovel this week. Oh, right. <laughs> this weekend. Actually, an extra hour to recover. <laughs> uh, or that, Because we change them Saturday night into Sunday, Saturday into right? Saturday morning, yeah. Spring forward, fall back. Yeah, okay, we spring so forward. Forward. Okay, thank you. <laughs> that gives us some extra time at night. Yeah. Not so much in the morning, but uh, yeah, beautiful day today. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at the uh, Harbor Cam. Oh yeah, look at that oh gorgeous my. calm before the storm. Isn't that lovely? Look at the uh, lights. Yeah. By this time next week, it should be light out there. Yeah, it's we'll just so beautiful shot. deceptive. It is. Yeah. Nice now. Check that out tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Well, so are we going to talk about tomorrow? Are we, we looking, are. are we going to be on the 20 side or the 30 side here in the Avalon? Come uh, on. No. Don't, no hedging. <laughs> Let's take a look at the forecast. That's hedging. <laughs> it is. There you go. Uh, that's uh, the satellite and radar right now. You can see that edge of that cloud cover is uh, moving in right now. And uh, if you can see that area of low pressure is getting itself organized. And that's what's going to bring our weather as we head uh, through the day tomorrow. So as we head overnight tonight, though, those temperatures were actually pretty lovely today and uh, the potential for some flurries along the west coast as well as coastal Labrador will eventually taper off as we head through the night and we change a little bit of that wind direction. Uh, so we'll get more of an onshore flow towards northern peninsula. Still looking at that potential for flurries along the northeast coast there as we head through the overnight. Same thing for coastal Labrador, but that will eventually taper off as we head towards the morning hours. Otherwise, it looks like a beautiful evening tonight. And uh, as far as those temperatures go, dipping into the minus double digits, certainly in those lower lying areas, minus 15 for Grand Falls, Windsor, those winds out of the northwest, 20 to 40 kilometers per hour for you along the west coast. And then uh, generally looking at about 30 to 50 kilometers per hour for areas along the northeast. Uh, as far as Labrador goes, quiet night tonight, Lab City down to minus 28. Your winds will be easing, so not much of a wind chill, but still feeling closer to minus 35, 36 uh, overnight tonight. Minus 17 will be the overnight low for Happy Valley Goose Bay. You're still looking at a chance of a few flurries as well. Now into tomorrow, going to watch this area right here because that's going to combine with the area of low pressure uh, that's going to move in and we could see some additional accumulation for you along the northeast coast there as we uh, tap into some of that moisture. But overall, we'll start to see that snow move in into the afternoon tomorrow and then continue into the evening hours. Areas right along the southeast of the Avalon, you could see some ice pellets mixed in, which will bring down your accumulations a little bit. But overall, that snow is going to continue as we head into Sunday morning and then uh, even through the day on Sunday. So snowfall warnings have been issued for the majority of eastern Newfoundland and then for uh, Bay of Exploits, uh, Bonavista North, as well as uh, Gander. You're looking at a special weather statement and you're still looking at significant snow anywhere from 10 to 20 centimeters with this one uh, for you. Uh, towards Grand Falls, Windsor, though, dropping off dramatically five to 10 centimeters. And then certainly uh, West Coast, you get to sit this one out. You're just looking at a chance of flurries really uh, through the day on Saturday. Nothing from this system, really. As far as the Avalon goes, looks like a good 20 to 30 centimeters is likely, but the winds aren't overall overly impressive with this one, but they are still going to be strong. And when you combine that snow, we're still looking at blowing snow through the day. This is where you'll be sitting uh, generally out of the north, uh, northerly component anyway, anywhere from 50 to as much as 60 kilometers per hour overnight on Saturday. The winds will pick up along the northeast. You're looking at gusts between 60 and 70 kilometers per hour, and that's where you'll generally sit through the day on Sunday. So even though those amounts are going to, or at least the snowfall amounts are going to come down a little bit as we head through the day on Sunday. Certainly for the metro area, you're still looking at snow and blowing snow. So this is the timeline Saturday through the day, about 15 to 20 centimeters by the time midnight rolls around. Then we can add another additional five to 10 through the day on Sunday. But note those winds again, 40 to 60 kilometers per hour through the day on Sunday. So again, reduced visibility is not going to be lovely out there for sure. So here's where you'll be sitting temperature wise into the minus single digits for the majority uh, of the, well, really everywhere across the island. 
Zero degrees for gross more, and those winds will be uh, out of the northeast, like I said, anywhere from 30 to as much as 60 kilometers per hour. Quiet for Labrador. Beautiful afternoon expected, which is great news uh, for those of you racing. Minus 12 for Lab City under plenty of sunshine, light winds as well. And then along the coast, you're into those minus single digit temperatures. So that's a look at uh, your forecast for tomorrow. We'll look ahead into Sunday, even though I gave you that forecast, but uh, for the rest of the island when I come back. Still to come, a local expert on the cruise ship industry weighs in on why the coronavirus is hitting cruise ship passengers so hard. Well, are you one of the many people in this province who booked a cruise months ago, perhaps feeling a bit nervous? You can't be blamed. Another cruise ship has been placed under quarantine over fears of a coronavirus outbreak. 12 cases were registered on a ship traveling on the Nile. 
This yet another blow to an industry already struggling with a surge of cancellations. So what could it all mean for the cruise ship season in this province? Our Carolyn Stokes talked with an expert this afternoon. Why has the cruise ship industry been hit so hard by the coronavirus? What is it about cruise ships? Well, a cruise ship is an ideal incubator for any kind of illness, uh, you know, because people are indoors for much of the day. They're continually socializing. Uh, it also attracts uh, people often who are more, who are older, who be maybe not quite as healthy. Uh, it's the people who have other vulnerabilities that often are become the sickest and end up dying from the virus. But I think it's the cruise ship being a closed environment, the sociality associated with it, it really increases the likelihood that when something occurs, it's going to spread and it's going to spread fairly quickly. Some insurance companies have come out and said that they're not going to uh, cover people who are traveling. How do you think that's going to affect uh, the cruise ship industry and just people yeah. traveling in general. Well, I think it's, it's definitely going to put a damper uh, on people's travel. I think just just the coronavirus itself. I, I have friends who were who, who had travel plans to Greece. They've now canceled them. I have other friends that were going to Italy and those have been canceled. I think already we're seeing those sorts of cancellations happening. And this is with or without insurance. It's regardless of cost. It's just for my own se sense of uh, of safety and, and and you know feeling good about it. I. I I guess I, I think for some people, who had the absence of insurance will make a will make a difference. It's hard to know to what extent. Would you take a cruise now? Um, I I wouldn't choose to take a cruise now. I would take I would go on a land based vacation without without any hesitation. But again, I think with taking a cruise, my fear would be getting stuck on the ship after an illness or during an illness, so that I go on a cruise for a week and I end up on the ship for for 21 days or more. Uh, in a p potentially uncomfortable situation. So I think just that re for that reason alone, I'd wait for things to settle out and uh, at least be a bit more predictable. St. John's uh, and other areas <coughs> of the province see a lot of cruise ships during the summertime. Uh, do you think that this is going to have any kind of an effect on the cruise ship uh, visitations to this province this year? Yeah, I wouldn't expect it to impact either positively or negatively with one exception, and that is if the cruise industry is hit hard, particularly the large cruise lines, uh, they may end up cutting some of their some of their itineraries. Now, given the nature of the cruise industry here, we may not be as affected by that because our main business is cruise ships going from North America to Europe or Europe back, which is a, quite a specialized market. Um, Again, I think the only way we're going to be affected is if those ships are not operating because of the coronavirus. So, for example, we get a, a, a number of, of ships from that are German passengers. Whether the Germans will be uh, perhaps more hesitant to travel uh, because of the coronavirus they're experiencing, and that's really hard to anticipate. Yeah, how badly is this going to hurt the cruise ship? industry going forward, will people not want to take cruises anymore because of this? Well, well, I think people are going to be shy about taking cruises for quite some time. If things resolve with the coronavirus in the short term, that is in, in a matter of, let's say, less than a month, I think they'll recover probably w w within three months to a half year. If the coronavirus continues to be a crisis through the summer, uh, my guess is that they're, they're going to have a long period of attempting to bring pa passengers back and attempting to reassure people that in fact cruises are safe. This week, CBC launched a nationwide series called Stopping Domestic Violence. And last night, our Ariana Kelland brought you a story about intimate partner violence and the children who were left behind. On Prince Edward Island, there's a special program for women who are considered at being at high risk of being killed by their former partners. The program is called Circles of Safety. Sally Pitt brings you that story. Anna? Yes. Hi, I'm Kelly. Hi, Hi nice to meet you. These two women were almost killed by their former partners. And this is the woman they credit with helping them stay alive. Today, they're walking with others who want to see an end to domestic violence. And how are you doing, Anna? <laughs> I'm okay. Help us affirm the important part we all play in the elimination of family violence. 
Hannah Povey and Kelly McCauley were both part of Circles of Safety, a program unique to PEI. It's for women at a high risk of being killed by their exes. To always have that ongoing concern of not knowing whether I should be looking over my shoulder or not knowing whether I should be taking different routes every time I walk someplace in town. It really sucks, I have to consider those safety measures. My name is Hannah Povey and I am a survivor of domestic violence. The Circle of Safety asks the woman what she needs to feel safe, not what others think she needs. Then it brings together people in her life who can help make that happen. Today, it's her current boyfriend, a co-worker, and Gloria. What are you worried about? Gloria Dennis is a support worker with Family Violence Prevention. I'm worried that even with electronic monitoring, he may end up going to stores that he knows I frequent and trying to look for me. To outside eyes, her boyfriend Will seemed perfect, but at home, he was a very different person. I was in trouble and I was in danger. Gloria asked me a question. Ooh. The question was, did I feel safe in any room of my home? And I only paused for a moment and responded back and said, no, I don't feel safe. Hannah had a safety plan when she first left Will. He's in jail now, but three months into a two-year sentence, he's applied for release. So she's bringing her circle together for a second time. Her plan could also include police and victim services. I had received a phone call from victim services. Will has applied for parole. I was really taken aback hearing about him having parole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she hadn't had much time to really recover. It's not your job alone. Everybody can take a piece of this. Concerns your safety. Having them ask me questions about what I wanted was a huge difference to how I had lived for the last year and a half. The control that was taken from me, I'm slowly regaining. My name is Kelly McCauley. I was in an abusive relationship for 20 years and survived. She'd left a dozen times, but always went back. He kicked in the bathroom door and uh, grabbed me by the hair and threw me up against the washer. Once I heard him getting a gun from under the bed, I really thought I was going to die. Four years after I left, my husband ended up killing his girlfriend. He was found guilty of second-degree murder. He appealed and got manslaughter. That was in 2015. It was the last domestic homicide on Prince Edward Island. And I got a second chance. I was one of the first uh, persons to do the circle of safety. I can remember them all sitting around the table and I was thinking, oh my God, all these people, look, they're all here for me. I think it kept me alive, yes I do, absolutely. Yep. Now the idea is spreading. Gloria is working with shelters in three other provinces so they can set up their own safety circles. Well, it brings the circles of safety to other communities. It would be great to see that being utilized across the country. I, sometimes I say it's kind of like my baby. <laughs> I, I really think that if we work collaboratively, then we're going to come up with better solutions. I think I'm a stronger person. I have a voice now. Um, I'm not scared to say anything anymore. It feels good to have someone to hold, but understands. Sally Pitt, CBC News, Charlottetown. Now you can read more stories from all across the country on this topic at cbc.ca slash stopping domestic violence. You'll find a link on that page to crisis lines in every province and territory. If you are in immediate danger and need help, call 911 and for further assistance and resources in your area, visit sheltersafe.ca or endingviolencecanada.org.
Well, National News Federal Finance Minister Bill Morneau says the Trudeau government deserves an A-plus for how it handled railway blockade protests over the past month. The blockades ground rail traffic to a halt for weeks, triggering layoffs and uncertainty over the reliability of Canadian production and delivery of goods. The minister says Ottawa showed that the situation could not go on forever, but he says there are no guarantees about the future. This has largely been resolved. I mean, the, the rail blockades are, are down. Uh, it was obviously a period of pretty intense discussions. Um, I, nobody can give us assurance that we won't have people in our country that will continue to have points of view that are different than the prevailing point of view. We live in a democracy. So, so I think that what we've demonstrated is that discussion can get us to a resolution even of particularly difficult challenges. Well, this probably isn't news to you, but Canadians pay some of the highest prices in the world for their cell phone plans, in some cases up to 40% more than what you would pay in the United States. Well now, as Jacqueline Hansen reports, the federal government says it has a plan of its own to slash cell phone bills for nearly half of Canadians. You're not ready for my phone okay, bill. Wow. In Canada, big cell phone bills are easy to find. My monthly bill is usually around 250. I was paying almost 400 a month. The federal Liberals campaigned on making them cheaper. A re-elected Liberal government will cut cell phone bills by 25 percent. We also have transparency measures. To now it's seeing that through. A government-imposed 25% price cut will apply to the big three carriers for plans of between 2 and 6 gigabytes. For example, the government says a 2 gigabyte plan that currently costs $50 per month would need to drop to $37.50. We anticipate this will benefit approximately 40% of Canadians. But in a statement, TELUS said it is extremely disappointing to see that the 25% decreases are limited to the national carriers. And Bell warned that policies discouraging investment, including regulating wireless pricing, put jobs and innovation at risk. But some consumer advocates believe Ottawa could have done more. Could they have done um, deeper cuts? Certainly. According to data released by the government, Prices have already been falling over the past couple of years. We expect them to be able to both handle these price reductions because they aren't really that difficult for them. And I don't believe they'll actually follow through and, and pull out their investments. And some Canadians' data demands already far exceed a six gigabyte plan. It's two to six gigs doesn't even sound like it. I would imagine that most people are, especially in the streaming world, going to be over that number. If the carriers don't meet the targets within two years, the government says it will consider other options, including taking steps to increase competition. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto.
The weather update is brought to you by Bell Tone, your partner in better hearing. All right, we're going to take a look at the weather once again. But first, uh, should we take a look outside and see what it looks like right now? Oh, pretty. It's beautiful Nice out. lights, shiny trees, and uh, no skeets breaking to our cars. Even better, security <laughs> camera. Uh, it looks quite nice out there, and yeah, our cars are safe. That's good. It's your last chance to get out and clear any ice or anything if you're going to do that tonight. Because? Because we've got all that snow on the way this weekend. So you're talking storm drains, wind, and uh, that kind of stuff? Well, storm drains, I mean, just going to get covered over and over them. again. But yeah. uh, anyway, just, you know, there's lots of ice out there mm -hmm. because of the freeze thaw we just had. So yep. maybe do that. Or don't. Yeah. It's all good. I've used so much salt this year. Yes. It's unreal. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, that giant pile by the harbor. Mm -hmm. Like that. <laughs> yeah, not quite. Not no, quite. Not quite. Where should we go? We're going to go to Sunday because right. uh, the system's going to stick around for parts of eastern Newfoundland. So here's what the future tracker is saying. So this is Sunday morning. You can see we're still very much into that uh, wind and the snow along the northeast. And as that low pressure system tracks offshore, we will eventually see the snow end and that will taper off into the evening hours. We've got another little area that will move through, though. That's going to spark some flurries uh, for parts of Labrador and then along the west coast as well. To get back into that onshore flow. That's where you'll see that potential for uh, some light snow through the day on Sunday. Eventually that will move through, maybe bring a few more flurries as we head into the early morning hours on Monday. Otherwise, ridge of high pressure starts to set up. That's good news because that means things are going to be nice and sunny up through Labrador for a little bit. So just wanted to show you that snowfall map one more time. Just because this does continue through Sunday, we are looking at the most snow falling for the Avalon, anywhere from 20 to 30 centimeters. We could see areas that see upwards of 35 centimeters by the time that's all said and done as you head west uh, significantly less snow about two to five centimeters uh, for areas in the white there so uh, as far as temperatures go we're going to stay uh, below zero but uh, climbing by a few degrees certainly in st john's minus one hanging on to that snow and blowing snow through the day again those winds will eventually ease as we head towards the evening but still going to stay strong even into monday it looks like Minus four for Corner Brook. Again, those onshore flurries possible for you. Mild and happy Valley Goose Bay, but we get into some of that colder air again for Lab City around minus 16. So let's take a look at the future tracker uh, into next week. Quiet uh, for the most part on Monday. It looks like a mix of sun and cloud for the majority of us. As that ridge of high pressure starts to set up, things are going to stay nice and quiet uh, for the majority of Labrador, but that's also going to bring in some of that colder air as well. So your overnight lows are certainly going to start to dip. Tuesday looks uh, quiet again, and then we're going to watch the next system move in through Wednesday. A little bit of a discrepancy on where this is going to track like always as we are this far out but uh, we could see areas that will see a change over to rain if it tracks a little bit further south which some models are pointing at we might see some snow again with that one so this is where we're going to sit temperature wise uh, by monday minus five into tuesday we're looking at temperatures dipping into the minus seven minus eight degree range but with some sunshine and then your overnight lows again going to be dipping into the minus double digits by Wednesday. Have one degree in there as we head into the evening or overnight if that low tracks. We could see some freezing rain with this one, but uh, again, we're still pretty far out. Minus three will be the overnight low, it looks like at that point. For uh, central Newfoundland, uh, after we get to the weekend, Monday looks beautiful, but chilly, minus 10. And then into the minus uh, teens by Tuesday and then recovering quite nicely by Wednesday. It looks like if we're hovering around the zero degree mark with that potential for some flurries. For western Newfoundland, your double digits come a little bit sooner on Monday, it looks like. And then by Tuesday, you should be sitting in the uh, minus single digits. And then that warm up really will come on uh, Wednesday for Eastern Labrador. There's that quiet but cold weather I was talking about. So minus 18 by Monday into Tuesday, your overnight lows really much through the weekend, dipping into the minus 20 degree range and then even colder for Labrador, flirting with those minus 30s again Sunday night into Monday. Uh, but uh, sunshine other than some flurries on Sunday, sunshine on Monday and then uh, that flurry activity will continue into Wednesday. Here's another calm before the storm picture. Mm, pretty. Beautiful fog there. I'll tell you where this is too when we come back.
Let's see who's celebrating birthdays and anniversaries. Best wishes somewhat belated to Lester and Grace Hines on their 63rd wedding anniversary last Wednesday, the 26th of February. And a happy 71st anniversary to John and Evelyn Thomas, now in St. Paul's River, Quebec. And 50th anniversary greetings yesterday to Ed and Ruth Anthony from St. John's. Happy 55th anniversary to Bruce and Hazel Jefford. And happy 59th anniversary to Annie and Ralph McDonald of Old Fort Bay. Happy 94th birthday to Annie Boland in Mount Pearl, a regular viewer of Here and Now. Thank you very much for that. Happy 90th birthday this coming Monday to Jean Dix. Congratulations. Happy 98th birthday yesterday to Dennis Dre in Dunville. And a special birthday to Elmo Baird, who turns 100 tomorrow. Born in Notre Dame Bay, raised in Twillingate after the Second World War, lived in Gander for 50 years, now resides in St. John's with his wife, Eleanor. Norman and Betty Perry celebrated their 61st wedding anniversary on Wednesday. They're from Nippers Harbor, but now live in White Bay. And happy 61st birthday to, or rather, wedding anniversary to Reginald and Irene Elliott in Raleigh. On Tuesday, Francis and Alice Payton in Norris Arm celebrated 50 years of marriage. And happy 50th anniversary to Freeman and Eileen celebrating today. We're keeping that informal. Don't have your last name, but hope you had fun anyhow. Happy 58th anniversary today to Brian and Betty Carter in Brigus. And a happy 92nd birthday to Gilbert Vinum in Botwood. His big day is coming up on Tuesday. Happy 91st birthday wishes to Mrs. Helen McGraw from Patrick's Cove. Happy birthday to Shirley Gibbs of Bonavista, who turned 90 on Tuesday. Happy 95th birthday last Sunday to Mary Gulliver. Happy 95th birthday yesterday to Josephine Mooney, originally from Brigus South, now lives in St. John's. Big birthday for Mrs. Ethel Templeman. She turns 100 this Sunday. Lloyd and Sue Johnson are celebrating their 50th anniversary today. Lloyd and Sue now live in Newcastle, Ontario. Happy 50th anniversary to Clarence and Lorraine Patey, formerly from Irish Town, now living in Hampton Junction. And anniversary greetings to Gerald and Joan Keane from New West Valley. They'll celebrate their 50th tomorrow. And another big 5-0 tomorrow, anniversary greetings to Walter and Mabel Murray from Harbor, Maine, but they're wise, they are celebrating in Florida, why not? Wishing happy birthday to William Cooper in Queens Cove, who turns 97 this Sunday, and a happy 91st birthday tomorrow to Florence Breen. And if you want to know a secret to getting to 91, there's Florence shoveling. <laughs> Great technique there. Hey, Florence, I know where you live. I am calling you to come help on Sunday. <laughs> that is a great technique. Yeah. That's great technique. Actually, uh, learn yeah. a few things. Fantastic, Florence. I'll be giving you a ring to come and help out there on Sunday. How much did you say? 20? 20 centimeters? 30. 30? 25 to 30 centimeters. Right. Oh, some on Saturday, some on Sunday. That's right. Yes. Oh, yeah, 20 Sh centimeters by midnight and then adding. Sharing. Up. Yes. Spread the joy right across the weekend. Why not? Yeah. Then it doesn't seem so bad. All right. But uh, we have uh, something to not quite sell. I guess the good news is we're going to lose an hour. That's so right. So we don't have to get up and shovel the time we normally would. That's right. But you get it in the day, at the end of the night. All right. Right. So and you have, you have a little bit of um, explanation for the history of why we're changing our clocks? Yeah. So it's interesting because you know why it's 2 a.m.? 2 a.m.? No, 2 I want. Uh, most people do it sat so Saturday night. You don't, you're not one of those really anal people who sets the alarm for 2 a.m. Sunday to get up to change the clock, right? Who has things that they have to change There's anyway? There's people in the office okay. who do that. Okay, well, By I don't. The My book. phone does it automatically. Okay. <laughs> All right, so what's, what's the history, Professor so Brawweiler? The history is the fact that at 2 a.m. it mm -hmm. had to do with the Amtrak, so the railroads, and yeah. that was the only time that there was no uh, train scheduled, so it didn't mess up the train schedule. So this is a New York thing? Yes. Okay. Isn't that interesting? I'm going to blame New York for this. I thought that Okay, was so let me get this straight. So there's no train coming, so it's not going to inconvenience or foul or things up. The, or change the, the schedule. Timing. Yeah, change the so schedule. So it's because of them. There you go. Another fact for you. Yeah. Because <laughs> I thought and people sort of said it's because farmers needed so much There's a whole bunch of different to... things. And there's that too. There's a whole bunch of different history behind it. But it's mainly war. War uh, things. <laughs> Why are you looking at me like that? <laughs> I'm so confused. I know. Me too. All right, let's look at the picture. There less it confusing. Is. This is way less confusing. How gorgeous is that photo? Some uh, fog. It's got a, is that a stage? Snow? 
I'm not sure. Uh, I'll take a look now. St. Lunaire. There you go. Beautiful spot. Yes, it is a beautiful spot on the Northern Peninsula. I think it is. I think that is a stage. Yeah, it does look like yeah, a stage. But man, Frozen. They've got some there ice. you go. They've got some ice and some snow That's and some right. fog. Yeah, Terry uh, Hederson sent us that lovely shot. Thank you so much for sending it in. And if you have any weather photos to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Uh, have a great weekend. Thanks for watching this week. We'll be back on Monday. And if you're shoveling, snow blowing, take it easy. <laughs> take your time. Get rid of it, but uh, don't overdo it. And That's we'll great. see you on Monday. Good night.